uh, organized by the Leiden University Center for the Study of Islam and Society. Our guest today is Professor Jeffrey Herman, who will talk about challenges and pitfalls in assessing the impact of Zoroastrian culture on the Talmud. Jeffrey is Professor of Late Antique uh, of Ancient Judaism and Classical Rabbinic, uh, rabbinic Literature uh, at Ecole Pratique in, in Paris. Uh, and he's the author of, among others, uh, of the book uh, Prince Vedata Kingdom, the Exilarch, the Exilarch in the Sasanian Era. So, uh, without further ado, over to you, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, May, for the introduction, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure and a, and a great honor to take part in this series. Um, what I would like to do today is to tell you a story. Uh, it's about the discovery of Persia by the Jewish scholars of the Talmud their romance with Persia, their estrangement, and then complicated uh, reacquaintance. We'll progress chronologically and then thematically dealing with the various academic uh, areas of discovery, advancement and regression. The account of Europe's discovery of authentic Zoroastrian texts usually begins with Monsieur uh, Anquetil du Perron, who uh, uh, at the end of the 18th century, traveled to India and uh, brought back and then uh, published uh, previously unknown Zoroastrian texts. Our story starts a little bit later. The debates relating to the Bible did not seem to have had an immediate impact on the Jewish intellectual world of Europe at the time. Ultimately, though, it was an inner Jewish issue that provided the powerful impulse and catalyst for the entry of Persia uh, into discussion about ancient Judaism. It was the Jewish Enlightenment, or Haskalah, a reform uh, trend that shook the Jewish scholarly uh, world in the course of the 19th century. Jewish scholars noted the popular uh, scholarship on Persia and the impact of Persian religion on the Bible and applied the investigation to their own sources. Some saw the potential for their own agenda in highlighting what was seen as the new discoveries and scholarly consensus of the times, the deep impact of Persia on Israel. Some sought to, chain, to change Judaism from the inside, challenging certain established Jewish laws and customs. Much of this came from the Babylonian Talmud, uh, or Bavli. But the Babylonian Talmud was created by a Jewish community living under the Persian Empire, the Sasanians. It seemed very promising. They searched through the Bavli for Persian influences. In this way, they could undermine its credibility. Those who desired to cleanse Judaism uh, from characteristics that they perceived to be unsavory argued that such elements were foreign accretions that should be abandoned in order to return to a more pristine form. Evidently, not everything Persian was to be condemned. Jewish tradition has good things to say about Persian modesty. Uh, table habits, for instance, and Persian law had been acknowledged um, by one of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, Samuel, who had famously declared that the law of the land is the law. Perhaps um, I should just say a few words um, about the Babylonian Talmud for those who are not yet uh, fully familiar with it, this work. It's a work of Jewish law in uh, Aramaic and Hebrew. It reflects the teachings of the rabbis of Babylonia from the third to fifth centuries of the common era. It's framed as a commentary to another work, the Mishnah, Codex of Rabbinic Law, that was redacted in Palestine in the early third century, and also cites and discusses lots of other rabbinic teachings from Palestine, both anterior and contemporary uh, to it. The subjects that are dealt with in, this, in, in the Talmud, um, civil, war, uh, civil law, ritual law, purity, impurities, temple sacrifices, marriage and family law, prayer and other areas. And although it was put down in writing, it's essentially an oral work, preserving oral traditions and transmitting them also orally. It includes carefully redacted legal discussion, cites the views of hundreds of rabbis from both Palestine and Babylonia. It contains discussion and digressions on numerous non-legal topics as well, such as biblical exegesis, legends, dream interpretation, magic, astrology, 
medicine and history. Basically, it's a very large work. Now, an interesting example of this trend uh, um, to explore the Bavli for Persian influence is Yoshua Heschel Shaw. He maintained a journal called Hechalutz and devoted a few issues to dense, comprehensive, uh, to a dense, comprehensive thesis um, uh, that listed parallels throughout rabbinic tradition uh, to Persian literature. He read the publications and translations appearing in German and other languages and drew from his immense knowledge of rabbinic tradition. Another uh, scholar of this time was uh, a man called Shlomo Rubin. He wrote a book called Persia and Judah and the subtitle on beliefs and customs that our forefathers received during their sojourn in the Babylonian exile for the Persians and their religions. He was quite open about his objectives. He explains at the beginning that the purpose of his book is to show and teach that not all of what our forefathers received from the Persians was the most fitting and appropriate and worthy of being absorbed amongst us for generations to come. The opposite is in fact the case, only a little, and just that concerning ethics and good manners, which our forefathers learned from the Persians, their close friends, are important and worthy of being preserved. However, most of their views and customs are not in accord with the spirit of true Judaism and are not suitable to be grafted onto the tree of life, but rather to be distanced from the borders of Israel as a strange branch in our vineyard. This he published in 2009, following an article he'd published earlier in 2000, in, in, so in 1909, following an article he'd published in 1867. Um, there were others, however, who were more, um, um, who were more serious. Returning for a moment to Shaw, um, um, he uh, made a number of very interesting discoveries. Among them was one for which he claimed, even the stubborn cannot maintain within himself the lie and deny that just as I have claimed, it is indeed so. He had found a Talmudic parallel to a source in the Bundahitian, a Zoroastrian text of great importance that had just been uh, published or a translation had just been published in German. This is the source that he that uh, he found and the parallel. It's taken from the uh, Babylonian Talmud, uh, tractate Yoma 21b, dealing with the typology of fires. The rabbis taught, there are six fires. Uh, there is that which consumes but not, does not drink. And there is that which drinks but does not consume. There is that which consumes and drinks. There is that which consumes wet as dry. And there is fire that repels fire. And there is fire that consumes fire. Uh, and now he begins to explain this list. There is that which consumes but does not drink. This is our own fire. That which drinks but does not consume. This is the fire of the sick. Uh, that which consumes and drinks. This is the fire of Elijah, as it is written. And the fire licked up the water that was in the trench. A citation from uh, the Book of Kings. That which consumes wet as dry of the temple altar, and fire that repels fire of the angel Gabriel. Fire that consumes fire of the divine presence, or Shekhinah. As the master said, he stretched forth his finger between them and burned them. A reference to a story of the creation of uh, Adam. Now, the uh, parallel he found is in the Buddha Hishan, chapter 18, aside from the new translation um, by uh, Agostini and Throp. Uh, it says in the Dane, um, he fashioned five kinds of fire. Then it lists the five uh, kinds of fire. Uh, Borzishwang fire, the Hufian fire, or Wazisht fire, the Wazisht fire, and the Spanish fire. Uh, then it explains the fires. The Bozishwang uh, fire is the fire burning before Lord Ohmazd. The Hufian fire, which is ex explained as the good conductor, is the fire in the bodies of men 
and plants. There was ish fires in the clouds where it uh, fights against Spinjarush. The Spinished fire, which means beautiful, bountiful, is the fire at work in the world. So too is the Waharam fire. Of these five fires, one consumes both water and food. And this is the one created in people's bodies, in their stomachs, and its duty is digesting food and water. Another consumes water, but not food. This is the one in the plants that lives and grows by means of water. Another consumes water, uh, food, but not water. This is the one at work in the material world, so to the haram fire. Others consume neither water nor food. These are the wazisht fire and the wazishwang uh, fire and the fire of the earth and in the mountains and in other things. And uh, the source continues to deal with fire, but this is the uh, extent of the, the parallel. The rabbinic source starts as a baraita, meaning uh, an earlier tradition where it begins the rabbis taught, a typology of fires transmitted in Hebrew, and it's followed by an explanation from a later uh, period, partly in Aramaic. It includes examples, scriptural citations, and proof texts from elsewhere in the Babylonian Talmud. The uh, examination of this uh, parallel continued with James Darmstetter, um, who together with Shaw set out to demonstrate how the parallels are precise, almost perfect. They assumed a relationship between them and asked which came first. Darmstetter maintained that the Talmudic one was secondary. It's artificial, combining types of fire, altar, fever, shechina, which are fixed, with one-time occurrences or historical events, such as the fire in the, ca in the case of Elijah on Mount Carmel. He argued that the, that the contradiction between the expectation created to the, a general formulation, six fires, that is categories, and the unique nature of some of them indicates a reworking of the material. With the Zoroastrian sources, in contrast, the presentation of six fires exists in an earlier source than the Bundahishan, the arrested Yasna, and the continued categorization makes sense in a Zoroastrian context. Now, one thing deserves note in this example. Fire is, of course, a central feature of Zoroastrian religion and not a minor detail. Hence the notion that those living in a Zoroastrian empire might be aware of it and even affected in one way or another is greater. And elsewhere, I've discussed this case um, as well as how the Jewish festival of Hanukkah, which focuses on kindling candles, is treated differently in the Babylonian Talmud than in other rabbinic sources from Palestine. And we'll get back to this a little later. Another scholar from this early period was Alexander Kruhut. He too had independently, he insisted, noticed this fire parallel, but he focused in his doctorate on demonology that he linked to Zoroastrianism. His enthusiasm wasn't, however, shared by all. We see here in this slide, two articles by Israel Levy, uh, a French scholar from the 19th century, from uh, my institution, in fact. He has uh, um, two articles on the right. He notices a parallel from the Talmud to a source that was recently published um, um, called Gujastaga uh, Abalish. But in the left, he uh, discusses some other issue of demonology, and he notes in passing, uh, one sees how dangerous it is sometimes to look in Talmudic legends for memories of historical um, events and how and how imprudent it is also uh, to to uh, to swiftly establish comparisons between Jewish demonology and that of the Persians. Uh, Kohut also dealt with mythology and um, and lexicography as part of a major lexicographical venture to update the medieval dictionary of, uh, of rabbinic literature, the Aruch by Natan ben Yichiel of Rome, he proposed countless Persian etymologies. He was not trained in, in Iranian languages, however, and the critics didn't spare him. The link between Zoroastrianism and Jewish demonology took another blow, as more serious studies of Jewish incantation bowls appeared. It was observed that they didn't live up 
to the expectations that many scholars had prepared for uh, prepared us to find. Not only were the demons not particularly Zoroastrian, but little particularly Zoroastrian could be found in this ancient source that was supposed to epitomize the impact of Zoroastrianism. Uh, in this uh, book by uh, James Montgomery from 1913, I'm making Cantation Bowls from Nippur. We see uh, his comment here. It may be remarked that the never ending enlargement of categories of evil spirits, apart from eclectic causes, may be due to Persian influence, although hardly any of the details can be traced to this source. And later on in the book, uh, in a more reflective uh, uh, tone, in recent years, so much has been made of Persian origins for Western religion, philosophy, and magic. I am surprised to find hardly a trace, even in a word, of the Zoroastrian system upon our bowl magic. And uh, he concludes by, by suggesting, has the influence of Persia perhaps been overrated? Um, The interwar years witnessed a more restrained approach to the field among the Jewish scholars. Interest in Persian religion and the Bible had declined more generally as other sources were being discovered. Isidor Shiftelovich, a German university trained scholar, devoted a volume to the topic of ancient Persia and Judaism with a somewhat broader perspective and more of a comparative religion approach, less about the Talmud. Louis Finkelstein would still in 1929 evoked the notion suggested by Rubin that the term Pharisee derived from Persian, from Farsi, and all that is implied by this link. However, the tide had receded. Uh, on the particular topics of the Babylonian Talmud and Zoroastrianism, one can mention that a German, uh, um, that a German uh, uh, rabbi and scholar, Herbert Finkelscherer, had published a pioneering comparative uh, study of the Talmudic law with the help of Bartholomew's German translations of sections of the Sasanian legal treatise, Madiani Hazar Daristan, in Vienna, when a team of scholars had decided to produce a corrective to the edition of the Rabbinic lexicon, the Aruch, the detailed entries on Persian loanwords were entrusted to Bernard of Geiger, who had training in Iranian languages and also had ex uh, experience with the academic study of Rabbinic literature. And he also published. Uh, two German articles dealing with lexical issues. The assumptions um, assumptions uh, that had been part of the conversation of the late 19th century were now largely sidelined. Were the Zoroastrian sources still considered um, important for the understanding of the Talmud of Judaism? One way to exemplify the shift is by the following facts. In the Jewish Encyclopedia, a major academic achievement published between 1901 and 1906. There are detailed entries of between five to eight columns each on topics such as Zoroastrianism, Avesta, and Pakhlavi literature and the Jews. The Yiddish lexicon, Yiddish's lexicon, a shorter German language encyclopedia produced in Berlin in 1929, and another one, uh, the Encyclopedia Judaica, also in German from the same period, continue this uh, this tendency. However, the English language Jewish Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Judaica published as a first edition in 1972 and the second revised edition in 2007 had no entries at all for any of these subjects, neither Zoroastrianism nor Avesta. Under Pahlavi, it contained two new entries, one for Reza Shah Pahlavi and the other for Mohammed Reza Shah Pahlavi but nothing on the Jews in Pakhlavi literature. Jacob Neusner, sorry, Jacob Neusner, who in the 1960s had worked on the history of the Jews in Babylonia, initially devoted himself to learning Persian and highly valued Persian studies. The first volume of his history has its dedication in Middle Persian. He became skeptical, however. This he expressed in his article, How Much Iranian in the Babylonian Talmud? To which his answer is that it is quite minimal as one might expect. He understood that the Jews were a part of an Aramaic uh, context between Persia and Greece. Uh, that was his understanding of, uh, of, of matters. His engagement with Persia uh, was as a historian of the Jews. Seemingly, he read the text separately, not together. 
And when the Talmud spoke of Persia or Magi, he took note. But when the Persian text mentioned Jews, but that was all. The Talmudic philological side had little appeal to him as did close readings. Henceforth, he had little to say on the topic with two exceptions. But now his agenda had changed and his interest uh, also in rabbinic literature. His subsequent comparison with the Zoroastrian works was odd and superficial, subordinated to the idiosyncratic take of his own of rabbinic literature. In the meanwhile, in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, there was a growing interest in Persia. Undoubtedly, the epicenter was Shaul Shaked, who was still active in the field. From the 1960s, he offered courses on the languages and religion of ancient Persia, trained scholars in the field, and although himself not a Talmudist, had a solid understanding of the literature and remains an authority to turn to. His additional interest in the Babylonian Jewish magic bowls, a uh, material corpus contemporary to the Babylonian Talmud, has made his contribution to the issues addressed here primary and not secondary. The Iranatum uh, Judaica Symposia that he initiated and their published proceedings became a platform for many publications in the field. Thus, scholars interested in the history of Babylonian Jewry, um, such as Moshe Baer and Isaiah Gaffney and their students would consult him. Ephraim Orbach also evoked Zoroastrian religion occasionally. Of supreme importance were the studies of the major Talmudist Eliezer Shimshon Rosenthal. His studies were lexical, but much more, including one entitled Talmudica Iranica. He emphasized the importance for Talmudists of acquiring a first-hand knowledge of, this, of the Persian languages and culture, and the references in the footnotes show that he had done this for himself. Um, Moshe Beer returned to Zoroastrian legal sources in translation when uh, studying uh, slavery in the economy of the Jews in Babylonia and for many other topics in the history of uh, Babylonian Jewry. Gaffney's studies on Babylonian Jewry too reflect a close engagement with the historical uh, with the historical studies, and Moshe David Hare devoted two uh, articles to topics of relevance. And there were also studies on Persian literary motifs in the Bavli in this period. Scholars were turning to the Persian sources, among others, to enrich their understanding of Talmudic Jewish culture, as historians usually work. The assumptions were limited and usually balanced. Two doctorates, for example, appeared on social history in the 1990s on the Jewish uh, on Jewish women in Sasanian Babylonia, one by the Adiel Shreman, the other by Eliyahu Achdut. Shreman, an appendix considered Chwedoda, the Zoroastrian incense marriage customs, with first degree relatives. Eliyahu Achdut had devoted himself fully to integrating Jewish history with Zoroastrian uh, studies. And besides his doctorate, published two articles before leaving academia for his other profession. Uh, Almost all of the Israeli scholarship on this topic is published in Hebrew. At some point in the early 2000s, an American scholar, a Talmudist at Yeshiva University, had an epiphany. Yaakov Elman determined that Talmudists must study Zoroastrian literature to better understand, or perhaps to understand the Talmud. He set a remarkable personal example, devoting himself uh, to this study, and in a flurry of publications, public lectures, enormous energy promoted uh, this direction. He hooked himself up um, with noted scholars of Zoroastrianism, with, uh, with noted scholars of Zoroastrianism, Okta Shervo in Harvard, Maria Matsuch in Berlin, and Naz Wazami in uh, Colombia. And the impact was felt immediately and drew a lot of interest. From now on, if you dealt with a Talmudic topic and didn't probe, as the Rastrian context or parallel, you had to explain your academic deficiency. He trained a couple of doctoral students and a number of others followed his, his lead, presumably under his inspiration. Um, Elman and others joined the Irani Judaica Symposia organized by Shol Shaked. I met him at the last three symposia that took place. But perhaps the peak of this trend was a conference organized at UCLA um, a foundational event that brought together many of the Talmud history and Zoroastrianism scholars for a few days and was subsequently published under the title, The Talmud in its Iranian Context. There's been a lot published in this field, not all connected with Elman, his uh, some uh, recent books. The basis of the Elman 
uh, Elmanite school of thought, as I understand it, is embracing the Persian sources as the key context for studying the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud, which is a product of the Sasanian milieu, is perceived as indebted to contemporary Zoroastrian religious culture in a profound way. It is claimed that the two shared modes of thought and scholarly structures of textual analysis. We find among its, its proponents claims implicitly and explicitly of similarity in ritual and legal practices and mutual engagement is taken for granted. Zoroastrian sources, law, ritual, are thought to be the context of sources within the Babylonian Talmud in places where this connection is not explicitly suggested by the sources themselves. Whereas earlier scholars were looking for evidence of Iran in the Talmud, we were now told that this was an Iranian Talmud. The assumptions inherent in this approach were far reaching and audacious. Was it not necessary to prove contact between two different religious scholastic communities? And what constitutes proof? To what degree was the Zoroastrian effect pervasive in the Sasanian Empire? The Jewish literature, after all, was produced in Aramaic by rabbis whose language was Aramaic. Some topics were similar, such as issues of impurity. One could see similar lines of reasoning on occasion, but there's so much that is different. Jews didn't advocate marrying their mothers or cleansing with cow's urine. Much was published in this period, but a few very strong, demon but a few very strong demonstrations of this new perspective would certainly have gone further than many weak ones. One article in this wave, for example, compared gazing through transparent objects in Pahlavi and rabbinic literature. What was compared? The Zoroastrian ritual of Sagdid, where a dog's look cleanses from impurity, and the gaze of a menstruating woman, which is considered destructive. On the Jewish side, the sighting of the new moon that needs to be direct, not to water, for instance, and seeing nakedness, which is not allowed while reciting the Shema, a sacred biblical text, in Judaism. In both cases, they discuss indirect view through a reflection or through water and debate the validity of such a gaze for ritual purposes. It was argued that notwithstanding the differences, I quote, the rabbinic and Pahlavi legal discussions intersect precisely in their abstract concerns relating to the definition and parameters of the gaze and subsequently of the status of gazing through intermediary objects, unquote. Elman, who died in 2018, was something of a force of nature. And as with the laws of physics, for every action, there's a reaction. It took several forms. Some Talmud scholars started looking elsewhere. Daniel Boyarin, uh, for example, pursuing another agenda, sought to highlight Greek in Babylonia. I'm sorry. Uh, another scholar, Richard Kalman, who had earlier participated in the UCLA conference, now in his most recent book, Migrating Tales, argued for alternatives to the Persian context, at least for Talmudic stories, and highlighted the path of the Roman Eastern provinces for the impact of, of many stories in the Bavli. Together with Jeff Rubenstein, I organized a conference with the express aim, uh, express aim of of broadening the context. The most direct criticism came from Robert Brody, a Talmud professor from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He published in Hebrew a critique of Shai Sekunda's book, The Iranian Talmud, and in English, he penned a critical essay against the trend that he dubbed the new parallelomania, in an issue of the Jewish Quarterly Review that included responses. The brunt of his criticism was aimed at Elman and involved close uh, criticism of four of his articles, but he also shot indiscriminately at almost anyone who had written on the field in the previous decade. For instance, Elman had written an article on returnable gifts in rabbinic and Sasanian law. The issue is as follows. During the Jewish festival of Sukkot, Jews perform a ritual uh, of shaking a set of four agricultural uh, species. 
products, uh, a citron, a palm a branch, and two others. Jewish law requires that they belong to the Jew, but these four species could be expensive and rare, and so the ritual might be difficult to perform. Uh, the notion developed that once one performed the ritual, the set could be given as a gift to the next person, so it would now belong to him. But how would the original owner get his set back, for example, for the next day? A, a, a returnable gift, given on condition that it be returned, was developed. Alman claimed that this was a Babylonian rabbinic innovation borrowed from Sasanian law. Of course, the issues in Sasanian law were quite different. It was the concept that was borrowed. Brody, however, asserted that the seed of such a legal notion was already found in rabbinic sources from Palestine before the Babylonian Talmud. Hence, they wouldn't need Sasanian law to develop things in this way. He also argued that the issues with Sasanian law were not comparable. Brody's conclusion to his article, um, pardon, uh, conveyed his understanding of the Talmud's relationship to Persia and deserves to be uh, read in full. There's no denying the Iranian context in which the Babylonian Talmud was produced, and the Talmud itself contains explicit references to various aspects of Iranian culture, as well as some allusions to it, which are quite clear, although not explicitly marked. Although additional instances of Iranian cultural influence undoubtedly remain to be discovered, there's reason to suspect that this influence was limited to certain realms. In particular, traces of an Iranian impact are most obvious in areas that might be broadly described as folklore, and elsewhere he specified demonology. While influence in the area of law appears to have been limited to a recognition of the legitimacy of the law of the land in matters of taxation, eminent domain, and grants of land tenure, and a consideration of some of the implications of this recognition. And finally, research in this area has sometimes been conducted with more enthusiasm than caution and would benefit greatly from a combination of lowered expectations and higher methodological standards. Despite his assessment of the potential of the field, his criticism, where valid, primarily demonstrated weaknesses in Elman's Talmudic scholarship and didn't undermine the potential with better scholarship. Neither could his evaluation that Assyriology provides more promising ground for comparative work have helped his own credibility. But notwithstanding the many differences between them, he found himself on the same side as Neusner in his assessment of the Talmudic engagement with Zoroastrianism. Ultimately, one might conclude that he saw the Babylonian rabbinic activity as almost exclusively aligned with that of, the rabbinic, of their rabbinic brethren in Palestine. Despite living in the Sasanian milieu, rabbinic Palestine is their key context. And this is actually the view of most Talmudists and how they approach their sources. It is how the sources often present themselves. To undermine this perception, one would have to work a little harder. There was also another issue at stake here. A well-known dichotomy in rabbinic studies divided the legal and the non-legal with a hierarchy whereby the legal is taken more seriously. A willingness um, to acknowledge extraneous influence in the non-legal but not in the legal would establish an irrational divide between the two areas of human endeavor. In certain areas of, uh, of Persia and the time, what significant progress is visible. Maria Matsuch, a respected expert in Zoroastrian law, has pub published a series of articles. And in a sense, her contribution has been highly valuable, but at the same time, less ambitious than some of the others. She deals with Persian legal terms attested in the Bavli and uh, provides context and precision uh, by discussing how these terms are used in Zoroastrian legal sources, especially the seventh century Madiane Hazar Daristan. Her analysis is careful, detailed, and important. And this, despite the fact that she is not a trained Talmudist, nor familiar with the scholarship conducted in modern Hebrew, including the revised Aruch lexicon. She confirms that there is more than meets the eye, and that rabbis knew the Persian law and applied it 
with precision. I myself have recently examined where in the Talmud the legal terms appear. The Talmud is a carefully redacted work that contains datable strata. We know a lot of, about the internal chronology of the rabbis who discuss matters in the Talmud. And I found that the Persian legal terms tend to appear later, uh, not at the beginning of the Sasanian era. The engagement of the rabbis with Persian legal terms and documents wasn't early then or immediate, but a gradual development. It might be hard to convince when comparing distant Zoroastrian and Talmudic sources on different topics, but what about when they deal with similar topics and seem to say similar things? How about the fire topology parallel we mentioned earlier? The early 19th century scholars tried to give the rabbinic sources, uh, the rabbinic sources evoked a Zoroastrian interpretation. This was a stretch. However, what we do have in reality is two religions, each drawing on its own ancient traditions as it creates a fire typology. The similarity between the two is not in the details, but in the very concept of a typology of fire and its presentation in terms of food and drink. Um, but after that, each tradition has delved into its own and made the topic its own. The connection then is more subtle. Why is the Talmud decided to focus on fire in this way? Why is the Bavli so interested in fire? Is it the Persian environment that has set the theme? Jews in Babylonia are conscious of the central tenets of Zoroastrianism, and it induces them to read their own traditions differently, to explore the place of fire in Jewish tradition, and to collect these traditions in a sustained discussion. And this happens in the Babylonian Talmud and not elsewhere because they live in a Zoroastrian milieu. On the topic of mythology, we have now remarkable studies uh, by the team of Reuven Kippervasa and Dan Shapira. Earlier scholars had connected some mythological creatures of the Talmud with Zoroastrian counterparts, but the connections were vague. These two have now demonstrated that a chain of stories in the Talmud, adventures of a certain rabbi called Rabbi Baba Hanna, evoke a series of mythological creatures that can be uh, clearly identified with a parallel list of Zoroastrian mythological creatures, also found in the Bundahishan. Hence, the textual relationship is established, at least for this type of source. The exact relationship between the two, how the Talmud knows this Zoroastrian source, needs to be discussed. But the evidence is solid. We can now make an observation. Both the typology of fire and the mythological beasts have their Zoroastrian parallel in the Bundahishan. Why is it that some of the clearest signs of shared sources come from here? The, uh, my last topic, the topic of demonology has returned to the foreground on account of the influx of new sources, the incantation bowls, and they have produced a relatively new challenge in assessing the impact of the Western culture on the Talmud. The observation by Montgomery from a century ago has basically not been refuted. The Zoroastrian religious world, including demonology, is very minor in the magic bowls, and we have by now seen hundreds upon hundreds of these texts. But there are some other Persian elements worthy of note. The Persian names of a huge proportion of the clients, those who ordered the bowls to be made. The occasional Persian loan words in the Aramaic texts. Those uh, who, um, and the rare but attested instructions written on the few bowls uh, on the outside in Pakhlavi script, presumably written by the Jewish scribe for the Zoroastrian client. We have here a slice of actual contact between Jews and Zoroastrian Persians and some indications of what this looked like. Uh, the field of Persian language in the Talmud uh, in, has seen the main advances through the increased accessibility for Talmudists um, of early and more precise Eastern textual witnesses, not just texts of the Talmud, but of the Gionim, the early medieval rabbis who cite Talmudic passages. Uh, a few words uh, to conclude. The study of Zoroastrian culture in the Talmud is something of a minefield. We must tread carefully. It's best to avoid the extremes and to stay in the middle. Both the initial surge a century and a half ago and the recent Zoroastrian turn in Talmudics have taught us of the need to advance slowly, methodically, and scientifically. With our better tools, however, additions and more sources and a balanced judicious 
approach, much of value can be uh, learned. Thank you very much for your attention. Look forward to uh, comments and questions.